Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our most popular cases. This is the third time we're doing this. These are the cases which seem to get the most comments, and so I'll review them with you and see if I can share some information. So we have 10 cases. Case number one shows multiple gastric polyps. Uh, we talk a lot about polyposis. We talk about the importance of technique. You need to distend the stomach with 750 cc's of water. I like water better than positive contrast, particularly when looking for subtle masses in the stomach. You also want to use IV contrast. Polyps can be seen in the stomach as incidental findings, but when you see multiple polyps, you think of polyposis syndrome, whether it's FAP or it's Gardner's or something else. We also think about multiple lesions in the stomach that are enhancing. We think about that as gastrinomas with multiple gastric carcinoid tumors. They tend to be very, very vascular. So we'll look at some of the images here. Very nice visualization of the lesions. Again, good gastric distension. You can see it nicely here on the coronal views, as well as the coronal here particularly in the fundus and body of the stomach. The lesions are very nicely shown. Okay, case number two. What are we looking at? Really prominent gastric wall enhancement. It looks like you drew this with a pencil or a pen. It's really thin. It's markedly enhancing. That means hyperemia. Typically, when you see this, we're thinking about gastritis. You can see enhancement with tumors, but then there's usually a break in the enhancement. When it's such a fine line, you're usually thinking about gastritis, though I will have to admit, as you look at these images in coronal view and 3D view, it's very unusual to see things like this where there's so much enhancement, but it's so pencil thin. We do see the wall thickening, which is accentuated when you look at the MIP imaging. Just a really nice example of abnormal gastric wall enhancement. Again, think gastritis, but you also have to think tumor. The reality is most tumors from lymphoma to adenocarcinoma to metastasis, linitis plastica, typically are hypodense. They're typically not going to be hyperdense. When you see increased attenuation, again, I'm always focusing on something that's going to be inflammatory. Here's the volume rendered views showing you the folds which are thickened in addition to the prominent enhancement. Okay, case three. We see pneumatosis. Now, whenever you think of pneumatosis, be it small or large bowel, you're thinking of ischemia. Now, not every case of pneumatosis is ischemia. And of course, it's a very important diagnosis because pneumatosis is associated with ischemic bowel, which can be a surgical emergency. Now, many things, benign diseases, as well as medication like steroids, can be the cause of pneumatosis. In this case, we see there's no inflammation. It's only large bowel, mainly ascending and transverse colon, very well-defined, very sharply marginated. And this is an example of pneumatosis of the colon, particularly right in transverse colon, but also in descending colon, that was a benign pneumatosis due to medication. Again, think of that possibility. Case four. Here we see a patient who's post-trauma who is pregnant. What do you look for? Obviously, you look for injury to the organs of the mother, but you also look at the placenta. If there's placenta injury, you could see decreased enhancement of the placenta, and then that may push you to deliver the baby, particularly if the child is over 30 weeks. Here you see the placenta. You see the fetus in good position. The patient is old enough to be delivered. I am concerned about the fetus. I am concerned about the placenta because there's not enough enhancement for me, and I would worry about this and tell this to the OB doc and to the trauma surgeons. And this patient was delivered successfully, and everything went well. Again, you can also look for trauma to the fetus, though that's pretty, pretty uncommon. Case number five is also an interesting case of a pregnant patient. You can see the 
patient's fetus barely. You can see the placenta, but you see the appearance of the spine relative to the skull. This would be described as a mermaid fetus. This is basically incompatible with life. This was eventually aborted. We can do CT at times to look at the spine or look at bony structures when there's concern for congenital deformities or syndromes and MR or ultrasound or plain films can't reach the diagnosis, CT can be very valuable as it was in this case. Now for case number six, it's a nice example of an aggressive infiltrating pancreatic cancer growing posteriorly involving the spleen, extending to and involving the duodenum, as well as involving the left kidney. There's the left kidney being small, obstructed, and having decreased function. You can see the stent in the patient's duodenum, nicely shown. You can see the right kidney functions normally. And again, the vascular involvement, the bowel involvement, the splenic involvement, and the kidney involvement by a very aggressive infiltrating pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So again, look carefully at the extent of disease. Here's some of the 3D maps showing you this in more detail even. In case seven, we see a mass in the spleen. We can go through a differential, hemangioma, cyst, metastasis, lymphoma. But what you see is a mass that's well-defined, kind of creates the bulging of the spleen. When I see that kind of appearance of a fairly homogeneous lesion, though there is some lower zones present, I got to think about a hamartoma. Hamartomas are benign. If you can recognize them, they're leave alone lesions. There's no malignant potential. There's no increased incidence of bleeding. You can't really biopsy them. So hamartoma is an important diagnosis, and this is just a nice example. I've been able to diagnose many hamartomas, but it's that bulging of the border of the spleen that's unique for hamartomas that allows us to make the diagnosis. And here is the coronal view and the volume rendered view. Again, multiple views really nicely showing you its really sharp margins, which you can see on arterial and venous phase imaging. Now in case eight, this is more of a technical point. If you want to examine the upper extremities for trauma, for grafting, for all sorts of reasons, and you want to look at the vasculature, have the arms extended above the head, make sure the patient's comfortable so they don't move, ideally inject in the contralateral extremity, and you can see here the occlusion of the left radial artery, not far from its origin, the importance of being able to look at this, being able to remove the bone with dual energy technique so that you have good vascular mapping. It's a really good technical challenge at times to examine the upper extremities, timing's an issue, getting good opacification's an issue, not getting motion. Make sure the patient's comfortable, arms extended, and then scan quickly. Scan from the uh, upper chest upward through the extremity. That works very nicely. As I mentioned, inject on the contralateral side. If there's one side you're especially interested in, usually a single phase acquisition works fine and you get good visualization. In case number nine, just a really kind of ant mini, there's a, a hardware in place in the tibia and femur. There's remodeling particularly of the distal femur the bones are really thin. This is a case of osteogenesis imperfecta. Very uncommon, but a really nice example. You can see the muscle mass usually is decreased. Patients have difficulty getting around. Complex fractures will typically occur. Finally, in case 10, this patient has perfusion changes in the liver. We're thinking about and looking as we go further, the patient has obvious pneumatosis, small bowel and large bowel. However, here the bowel is irregular, the pneumatosis is irregular, it's small bowel, it's large bowel, it's ascites. This is bowel that's ischemic. 
Remember, we saw a case of benign pneumatosis. There, there's no fluid. Margins are very sharp. Here, things are more irregular. It's large bowel and small bowel. There's thickening of bowel proximal to the pneumatosis. This is a surgical emergency. Patients have high morbidity and high mortality when they have extensive pneumatosis because it typically represents, in these type cases, ischemic bowel. Really nicely shown across the range of reconstructions. Also, make sure you look carefully at the mesenteric vessels. They're often small and can be occluded. So a very, very nice example. So those are 10 cases. I hope you enjoy them and see you soon on CTSS. Um, for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh, so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.